reconvene the, uh, the meeting for September 18th. We will now close the executive session and reconvene the public meeting. Uh, the purpose of the executive session was to discuss pending litigation uh, pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101I. No action was taken at the, by the commission during the executive commission. So opening the uh, public meeting, take call. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Commissioner Brixco? Yeah, think about that. Commissioner Bell is here, all present and accounted for. And now we are going to open up our public comment period. Uh, there are going to be two public comment periods tonight, <clears throat> one now and another one at 5.30. Um, out of respect for everybody, we ask that you uh, hold your comments to three minutes. Um, we're going to allocate uh, up to 15 minutes for this. We have two people signed up. Anybody else wishing to sp speak, uh, feel free to do so at the conclusion of their comments. And we'll start with Jim Kyle. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Jim Kyle with the Working Waterfront Coalition. I would first like to thank the Commission for chipping in on the uh, seven interpretive signs that are going in at Squalcombe Harbor. My understanding is they'll be installed uh, either Thursday or Friday, just ahead of the main sea feast day on Saturday. So thank you for your part in that. I would also like to thank you for um, the support that's required to do these major projects in Blaine. Uh, and I'm sp not going to speak to any specifics. There's a presentation coming and there's an MOU that's uh, up for approval and, a, and another one to be written. But I would like to thank uh, the co both the commission and especially the support staff for uh, taking into consideration stakeholder needs. Uh, I think that uh, a level of trust has been established that perhaps wasn't there at, to that degree before. And I'd especially like to thank Shirley McFerrin who led that, led that process. Uh, and I'm not speaking just about the shareholders uh, that are mentioned, or the stakeholders rather, mentioned in the action item, but uh, this process includes uh, boaters of all stripes, both recreational and commercial. We're probably forgetting a few user groups, but everyone has had a chance to take part and I think as a result of that, we're going to have a facilities that do an excellent job and will show great improvement, bring jobs, do all the great things that, that good ports can do. And I thank you all for your good work. Thank you, Jim. All right, I can read the Van Dyke in part, but is it Roger? Huh, it is. Oh, wow. There you go. If you throw fruit at him, your vegetables just a little to the, little to the left there. How, how ripe are those? <laughs> Mr. Bell. By the way, that's more than a pear. <laughs> <It's true. laughs> I can give you an attaboy on that one. <laughs> May I have my time extended for you? <laughs> You're correct. My name is Roger Van Dyken, and I come here uh, this afternoon to simply say thanks. Um, I have concluded 36 years as your tenant. Um, I have, in the process of which I've been privileged to participate in marina activities and port activities and the charter and the boating industry here and um, a couple decades on your marina advisory committee uh, co-founder of working with jim with the working waterfront coalition uh, co-founder of the pacific northwest charter association uh, think back when we started as your smallest commercial moorage customer, uh, one 24-foot slip, paying about somewhere around $30 a month to being ending as uh, transitioning out as your largest moorage customer um, and writing a check to you in the vicinity of $300,000 a year uh, for the 50 boats that we've had in charter. It's... Um, it's been a, a, a privilege as well as a struggle, but m mainly 
um, I wanted to say thank you. These pairs symbolize um, a few things. At number one, I have indeed left San Juan Sailing and um, am now engaged in other activities, other life's priorities, and I'm pleased to that the request to purchase came from within our organization and will carry on the fine tradition that they, more than my wife and I, have established, um, rising from becoming a unheard of one boat operation to becoming um, recognized as uh, one of the leading charter companies of excellence globally. Um, these are um, teardrop shaped. Um, because as, a, as your tenant, um, there's reasons for that along the way. Uh, when at times, um, there were a few of these shed, particularly inside when the commissioners decided, your predecessors, by the way, nobody here, uh, decided that after, although I'd been asking for slips for a decade and none could be found, when they lured my competitor in from Anacortes, they were suddenly able to find 30 slips for him. And uh, it turned out to be very well because when he decided that hmm, he had to vacate, I got a call from then director um, Jim Darling saying, need your help. We've got 30 empty slips. Can you help us out? Uh, which gave us the opportunity to grow into that and to that which we have. Uh, from sometimes uh, contentious with uh, excellent harbor masters to sometimes working with people who were almost excellent. And now working with, I'm pleased to say, continual improvement, uh, a level of excellence, cooperation, and uh, working together that I have never seen in my 36 years in business. From the commission level to the staff level. Uh, in particular, we have a very close working relationship with Harbor Master Kyle, and uh, there has been none better. Uh, and he has the instinct to not say, uh, the regulations say we can't do this, but rather, let's work together to see if we can't solve this for everyone. It's a little bit tart these particular pairs, and yet they're nutritious. So uh, that, in, in sum, is the um, essence overall of my experience as your departing tenant. One final word, if I may, and that is I want to salute the efforts of you and your staff to support the heritage of the working waterfront. It's not easy. It can be difficult, but it's worth protecting. And you're doing a better job than most other, almost any other port that I'm aware of anywhere in the country. Please keep that up. And finally, I want to present you with these because since I'm no longer your customer, I can. And it's not considered an in-kind gift that might influence you in my favor. <laughs> I'm going to chime in by saying um, I've known a number of people that have worked for you over the years, and um, you could not have been a better employer. Uh, you could not have been a better tenant. You could not have been a better spokesperson for the county uh, or for the port. And uh, we thank you in more ways than you can imagine for staying with us all those years, fighting those battles. But more importantly, thank you for being a very decent, very kind, very um, thoughtful um, person, because that really does shine through in everything that you do. So thank you for your time. You're very kind. Thank you.
That's the first standing ovation any commission's given, I bet. And Kyle, if you're watching, good job. Keep up the good work. <clears throat> Anyone else wishing to speak at open session? Okay. We'll now close that and move on to the consent agenda. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through L. Commissioner, do you have do you, any desire to pull anything from the consent agenda to no, discuss? I have a question on L. Oh, me too. Yes, sir. So I just want an update on it. This has come to us previously for an extension on uh, the budget and wondering if we are nearing nearing the end. If, if you could give us, are we 50% complete? Are we... Are we still crawling along like Bertha under the viaduct? <laughs> and if you don't mind, Adam, I've got to tag along with that because it's kind of in the same vein. Sure. Uh, mine is that we know that we're going to have this issue. We've got this issue now. We know we're going to have more of this. And is there any way that we can predict with any certainty what those increases might be so that uh, this isn't a continual uh, comeback? Or maybe we can budget for some more of this type of, because this is not the first time we've seen this, um, predict what that what that economic impact might be going forward and get ahead of the game from the budget standpoint? Well, Bertha under Seattle ought to answer that. And Yeah, thank you, Commissioners. Adam Fulton, Director of Facilities. Uh, it, both questions are very fair, and uh, the um, if I just take them in the way they came, we're just about done. We're uh, within just a week or so of finishing. We had to get into this commission meeting to uh, increase our authorization so that we're not, in fact, spending money we aren't authorized to spend. Um, it, it, we just keep hitting instruction, uh, obstructions under the ground, frankly. And how to prepare for that, and um, it, it's, just, it's a great question, and it's a fair question. And um, I don't know how much more digging we're going to do in the ground. Uh, because of the way our business structure works on that property. I don't know how much more development the port is going to do, aside from putting the road in in partnership with the city. Uh, from here on, I believe it'll be other people's problems, uh, I would like to think. In the event that we have to do more, uh, and that's very possible, uh, we will definitely use this to um, see if there's a way we can forecast and get it into a bid environment the pricing to uh, accommodate these kind of uh, discoveries. Easier said than done. But uh, that would be the, that's what we try to do with all of our projects. This is, I hope the commissioners can appreciate being on a seven year old pulp and paper mill where they probably didn't get a lot of permits and they filled every gap with everything they could find. And uh, <clears throat> now we find ourselves digging through that. So yeah, I, I think we paid a very, I think we paid the right price. I think we're in good shape going forward. I, I hope we have a better plan. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the commissioner's questions. Yeah, I, I just think that maybe a bigger contingency at some point, knowing that we've got this kind of difficulty on this site is, a, is an appropriate approach. A bigger contingency might help, but again, uh, we do our very best to pay for things as priced in a bid environment, not in a change order environment. And we think there's probably in the neighborhood of a 20% savings in so doing. And that's why, honestly, very seldom does the commission see this sort of increase. Uh, but, but I hope they recognize, along with us, this is a special circumstance. Mm -hmm. So for clarification for the people watching, Adam, that aren't, haven't been involved in the process, um, the reason these, these costs have risen is the unforeseen things underground that we couldn't see that they've run into and had to deal with. Um, am I correct? The commissioner's correct. So, so I, I think it would be very hard to ask people to bid on something like that rock solid with, you know, I mean, it, it, it's pretty hard to do. You, you don't know what's there unless you got like x-ray vision. Are you there? No? So anyway, just for clarification for the people watching, I wanted to, to, that, they, that this is unforeseen things under the ground that we run into is why that increase in costs. And from what we've heard previously, this is consistent with what the city is experiencing as well with, with their build-outs. The commissioner's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it, honestly, it probably will be the future of that site. You know, getting out of the ground is the difficult part.
it's going to be consistent with what every developer will experience there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it's the same developer, pretty soon they're going to if say the same construction company, they're going to have it figured out. <laughs> this is why they'll, the, have, they'll have the fork and stick out <laughs> right where everything is. Okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. fine with that. And I can say. The only I just had on H, I wanted to just uh, thank our staff for the continual work with the energy upgrades um, it, and the partnership with PSC on those. Um, it's just a continual, um, you know, good good progress that we're making there with each of those upgrades and the energy savings and the cost savings too with the grant program. So thank you. A motion to approve consent agenda items A through L. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. So before we move on, I'd like to say something. Now, <clears throat> while it's still in fresh everyone's, everyone's mind, what Roger said up here, I'd like to say thank you to our staff for at all levels and all sectors for the job you're doing because it's very evident in the gentleman that just spoke that you're doing a hell of a job, and thank you. I was going to save that for other business, but sure. <laughs> All right, Tiffany, Port Parks events update. Thank you. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Tiffany D. Simone, meetings and events supervisor. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief update on the um, parks and events. Uh, I'll start with the uh, summer's end, which was August 17th, Alex Dixon's event. Um, all went as planned for him. He sold, I heard, somewhere around 300 tickets pre-sale. I don't know how many at the door. Um, he certainly did a very good job getting in and set up and out in his reserved time and took excellent care of the park. And um, I don't know if anybody, anybody made it down there, but uh, went well and they had some really cool things that we haven't had down there before. So um, I do have not pictures here, but if you're interested. Um, it was a good event, he did a good job. Uh, no damage, everybody seemed happy. I, to my knowledge, we didn't receive any complaints during the event, um, so that's good. The second event, which was Rockin' to the Blues Festival, which was supposed to be held September 1st, um, that was Sherry Ann Trammell, she canceled her event. Um, so that's those two events, I think, uh, Going forward, if, if the commission decides this is the direction we want to go with more information, likely from economic development, who's doing a little research on what that looks like, um, it would be, after some discussion, my recommendation that we RFP for a certain number, perhaps early 2019 for a 2020 event, because I think that's the kind of planning it would take um, for that. So any questions on those two things? Just did you hear any feedback from the public on closing the park? Um, none additional. <clears throat> mm -mm, I did not. How about the commissioners? I know that there was, yeah. No. I haven't heard anything other than there was the one lady that asked about the, uh, um, the lady who canceled. Mm -hmm. a, a member of the public had asked me whether she was scheduling an event or had one been scheduled for her for next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did speak to you about that, and your answer was no, I believe, correct? Correct. So, so at this point in time, we have no events scheduled, right? No now. ticketed events scheduled Thank for, you. for the park, yeah. Um, and then I was hoping just to give you a quick little rundown of events that have happened and are coming up just on the horizon, um, if you'll humor me the time. So, we had Airfest just a couple uh, last week, a couple weeks last weekend, um, and that went well. We expected, we Estimated maybe 500, we were hoping. Um, we had about 2,000 based on the number of cars parked. Um, that event hasn't been held. I hope I'm not stepping on airport's toes. If they're here, I was just going to give a quick, quick update. Um, hasn't happened for about a decade, so I worked with airport supervisors uh, to, to plan that, and so we were all kind of fresh eyes. None of us had been there when there had been an air fest. So uh, we were very happy, um, got nothing but positive feedback and have some... Um, Good ideas going forward, hopefully, to likely grow that, I would think. Got really positive feedback from the public. Helicopter rides were sold out by two fixed-wing aircraft. People were taking rides on those, and those were for fee. So um, 
people were happy to be there. Um, it, it was a great event. Uh, I, I think I think our staff did a really fantastic job. My kids loved it. Yeah, they got to go was, on all it, the airplanes. They got to go inside the helicopter. And uh, it, it was very well attended, even for kind of a, a little bit rainy morning, too. Yeah. Um, so I thought it achieved a, a great goal of, you know, exciting people about the airport, the services we provide, and the general aviation community uh, that is there. So thank I, you. I really think yeah. that uh, the airport staff maybe got a little bit jealous of Sea Feast <laughs> and decided to have a similar event that was going to, you know, attract some similar attention. And I think they're on, on the right track with it. Thank you. I We, we definitely uh, went into it planning for sort of that younger family demographic um, and to bring awareness to the airport. And uh, if I could say one more thing about that, um, we do several events over our properties, the, the cruise terminal and, of course, at the harbor and, and now at the airport, and we get different levels of involvement with our tenants and we try to always factor that in and balance the community and the tenants and we just had super support out there which makes planning wonderful so I really appreciated that portion as well and, and we'll work a little maybe a little harder to get general aviation involved but certainly uh, San Juan Airlines and BAS were on board so we appreciated that we're thinking of doing annually now I hope so I'll leave it to Sunil <laughs> I see the I see the big guy nodding. Um, Full so, support from this end. Great. Um, so that uh, we also um, had have Sea Feast coming up this weekend. Um, I think most of you are, are showing up to that in some form or fashion. It goes all over town Friday night and Saturday night. Oh, Commissioner Bell was going to step up, but obviously. He so didn't. who's slurping? Slurping. Ah, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're looking forward. Only a two-year term for slurping. <laughs> I did my two years. So. We're looking forward to that, and that's grown, as you all know, and it's uh, all the staff in this room have had their hands in it and on it, and um, so we're excited to see that. Several other um, events have gone across Port Property in the last few weeks, the, the Bellingham Traverse, ALS Walkathon, um, uh, the, the Bellingham Bay Marathon registration happens down at the cruise terminal. Um, we have three Western events at port facilities today. And, and between that August 1st and December 31st, we have about 250 private events as well. So I just want you to be aware that those facilities are getting their use. So I have a question for you. We have a lot of talent in this county, young talent singers. Um, and so on and so forth that are trying to get exposure. And have we, or you, thought of putting on a music festival of just, just are not... Are you really going to ask me the week before Sea Feast? I feel like a bit. I'm, I'm not saying this year, but for the yeah. future. For folks that, you know, we're not hiring these bands to come. They can come and they can, they can entertain folks mm -hmm. through the day, different, different people, yeah. and get the exposure and their, and their local talent, people here in the county. There has been some interest and some talk. Um, we have that lovely stage at the Bellwether Peninsula that has all the power you could ever imagine and tie downs for wind that sometimes I feel like it's a little underutilized and potentially that could happen there. Um, I think, you know, it always becomes, can we get sound in and, and all of that? But, but I think there's real potential for that, certainly down there on the Bellwether Peninsula. Yeah. Well, it'd be kind of, yeah free entertainment and exposure for the folks that are trying to. Yeah. To, and there's some really good talent in this county I've been listening to. That That's a great idea. I'm always looking for something to do down there because it has everything we need. We don't have to bring generators or anything in, so. Just food for thought. Yeah, thanks. Anything else? Yeah, Mike, <clears throat> mine's just a little bit more. Um, okay. I, the importance of these kind of events are just, I can't be understated. Um, these bring a lot of high profile um, activities to the community that give nothing but positive um, impact, I think, to our community. I think every time we do something like this, it creates a sense of community, it's, it creates a sense of excitement. Um, and what I've seen from what you do and what happened at the airport and what's going to happen with Sea Feast has been nothing short of spectacular in why we live here. And I think using the port properties for these events is just huge. The summer's end got some good buzz. 
Um, the airport got some great buzz. Sea Feast is probably my favorite event of, of the year, but I just think this is what we need to be doing um, a, more of, uh, with the sole exception of Western Washington taking all the parking places at the Bellwether building <coughs> in first thing in the morning. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining. <laughs> I'll tell <a> But <laughs> no, I just want to say what a great job, what a great job of promotion. Um, I would love to see pictures of the uh, uh, of the summer's end online somewhere yeah or, or how we I'll, promote I'll, that yeah, i think it'd be out, great yeah. because i'd love to see more of this yeah so what a fantastic thing this is and what air you. show have we posted anything online about that about Airfest? yes uh pictures wise i no, but i sure can that i mean too? on our social media there's a few but Give the little guys in the county something to look at yeah, yeah. we should be, we should be bragging about what we're doing for the community because this is all a big deal great so yeah. thank Where's you mike is he Thanks. here we can get mike right on that where's he at <laughs> There he is. Thank and you. Tiffany, I just have yeah. one one thing back for the summer's end. Yeah. I heard uh, I, I spoke with the promoter, and yeah. you know one of the things he mentioned was that they sold about four, three, you know three hundred tickets, but they had about four hundred and fifty people. Mm -hmm. And one of the consistent comments he got from people who attended um, was, "I've never been down here before." Yeah. And Definitely so was a it, different demographic, which I really appreciated. It really yeah. exposed our facilities to a, a wider diversity of people, which I thought was was a positive. I agree. Um, and That's I would good. like to, I think you're on the right track with the 2020 and the plan out for, for shows, but I would also, I don't want to leave 2019 in limbo. Mm -hmm. And so I would want, like to see us also provide that security and planning opportunity for concerts for 2019. Otherwise, Great. it's going to be on our agenda three more times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Good job, Tiffany. <clears throat> okay, so that's it for that. Uh, now we'll move to the Salmon Hatchery Best Management Practices Update. Mr. Hogan. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Michael Hogan, Public Affairs Administrator. Well, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate and timely to report um, on the tour we took to the Macaulay Salmon Hatchery up in Juneau, Alaska, given the recent headlines on the southern resident orca whales um, that led earlier this year uh, Governor Inslee to declare an executive order looking at, among other things, um, providing funding to increase uh, hatchery production of Chinook. And then uh, Taliqua, the 20-year-old um, that captured international attention when she pushed her um, calf around for 17 days. I think there's a, a really huge lens on Puget Sound right now and a real interest in why there continues to be declining numbers of, of salmon in local water. Um, it's also timely given that we have Sea Feast coming up this weekend and we have uh, you know, such a passionate, energized, and strong local fishing community. And, and in fact, it was um, someone out of that community that, that really pushed the agenda for us getting up and taking a look at the Macaulay Hatchery. It was um, Doug Thomas with Bellingham Cold Storage, but certainly there have been others within the community that are um, very interested. And uh, just as a side note, I was one of the participants um, Executive Director Fix and Commissioner Shepard were also there, so this feel free to, to jump in. I, we were up there for a couple of days, and I'm still digesting all the information that we learned, and uh, I'm probably going to speak for too long, but um, probably not cover nearly enough of, of what needs to be talked about, because it, it is a huge issue. Uh, so we've, um, even though the, the, this issue has been in the headlines recently, um, we've actually been working on this issue for several years, and it includes a, includes a local stakeholder group with working waterfront businesses, local governments, um, Bellingham Whatcom County Tourism, Sandy, um, Bellingham Technical College, we have the existing Whatcom Creek Hatchery, uh, state entities, um, WDFW, uh, our elected representatives, and the Lummi Tribe, and it's a big issue for our community and for our state. Um, as you know, over 6,000 jobs in Whatcom County are created or supported by marine trades, over 7% of the local workforce. So um, uh, large numbers of salmoners are, are extremely important to what we do as a community and what we do as a state. Um, you know, so when we talk, so this is an old uh, picture from Pacific American Fisheries, and uh, you know, when you the best estimates are under 10% of the historic levels of salmon exist today out, out in Puget Sound. 
um, but it was important for our stakeholder group when we when we met, it was actually G.I. James with the Lummi tribe that said, okay, what is our desired outcome with this effort? And um, we came to a fact in, in recent memory, um, the fishermen talk about 1985 salmon stock levels. And if you look at this chart, it shows the total abundance of Chinook and Puget Sound rivers, and you can see uh, that decline. It goes from 1984 to 2010 and continues today. Um, The, uh, just, just a quick note before I get into the Macaulay hatchery about the Washington hatchery system. It's the largest hatchery system in the world. Uh, 83 Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife hatcheries, 51 tribal hatcheries, and 12 federal hatcheries. Over 75% of the fish that are harvested uh, in Puget Sound and the Columbia are, are of hatchery origin. So uh, huge numbers. When you look at Alaska, obviously it's it's different, and you're comparing, you know, apples to oranges. But it's about 30% of hatchery fish are, uh, or harvested fish are hatchery origin. Um, the hatcheries division is the largest single component of WDFW's fish program. And back in the recession of 2011, they had big cuts that have continued today, and that uh, resulted in um, reduced hatchery production. And they also have aging facilities, big capital needs, so. Funding is a big issue for the hatchery program. We're dependent on it through the state, and that's one of the um, key things that, that we can look at that's different with, Alas with the Alaska model. Um, and again, this, is a, this is, just shows the release. If you look in the middle of the chart, that's the 1980s. Uh, WDFW was releasing about 350 million fish per year. Uh, this goes to 2008, but if you projected to 2018, it, you'd be about 150 million uh, fish released per year. So um, big declines. And so when we talk about getting back to the 1980s uh, um, salmon stock levels, and then you uh, look at the amount of fish released, there, there's definitely a correlation between increasing hatchery production and the amount of fish that could be available in local waters. Um, flash forward to the, or switch over to the Alaska hatchery system. Um, this is a, uh, basically, this shows the, the numbers of, of wild stocks in blue that were harvested. And, and you can see at the very low peak, kind of in the middle, is in the 1970s. And due to overfishing, uh, there was, uh, you know, the, 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 the salmon stocks were in severe decline. And so um, Alaska started its modern hatchery program. And, and as you see the progression from 1974 to the, to the end of the chart, you can see that both the wild stocks and in green are the um, hatchery stocks and the amount of harvest is uh, both um, trended significantly upwards. So their hatchery program is something to look at where we're trending down. Their, their salmon levels have been tr trending up and way up. And um, a couple interesting things about their hatchery system is they, um, they authorized, back in the 1970s, private nonprofit hatcheries to take broodstock and then sell a portion of the returns to pay for the operations of those hatchery systems. Now, the private nonprofit corporations still operate under the regulatory framework, but that's completely different from Washington's hatchery system, which is mostly run by the state. Um, and so that commercial fishery cost recovery is a really important component of that system. Uh, they also set up a revolving loan fund program to fund capital and operating costs. And they, they have like a six to seven year payback, which is important because when you're starting uh, a sam salmon production or oysters or whatever, it takes quite a few years before, you know, to get the brood stock necessary to ramp up production and, and um, pay back that loans. So today in Alaska, 25 of 29 hatcheries are operated by private nonprofit corporations, and they're primarily um, self-funded through a sale of a portion of returning fish. Um, they also, most of the salmon they produce are pink and chum because they're, they're fast growing and they can release them straight from incubators into salt water. They put them into uh, salt water net pens and hold them for 45 to 60 days and then um, directly into the, into the environment. Uh, this is a picture of the Macaulay Hatchery up in Juneau, Alaska. Um, and it was formed in 1976 under the leadership of Lad Macaulay. They operated several smaller hatcheries before um, building the facility you see in the picture in 1990. Uh, they started out with pinks, which have a two-year return. 
and the Broodstock are easily available, and then they expanded to Chum, and then they finally added Kings and Coho and additional programs. Uh, when you walk in the facility, you're just struck by you know, how you know, neat and tidy, how it's, it's, it's a beautiful facility. There's beautiful art, interpretive exhibits all around. Um, we first met with Sam Raybung, who's uh, head of the aquaculture program for Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and uh, had an important message, which is, you know, even though the, the private nonprofit hatcheries uh, are, you know, are a big um, benefit to the commercial fishery, uh, protecting wild socks is their priority uh, in the state of Alaska. And there's a rigorous permitting process with public oversight. They start out with lower initial capacities and then they ramp up production from there with the permits. They always use local brood stock sources. Hatchery fish are, are tagged and monitored and they're always located away from significant wild stocks. Um, and then we were uh, given the opportunity to tour the dye pack facility. Here you can see the incubator room. Overall, they own three hatcheries and, and they, they do these uh, remote release sites that are located away from uh, uh, wild stock uh, um, f rivers and, and release points. And they're permitted to release 135 million chum, 50 million pink, one and a half million coho, and 950,000 chinook each year. Again, the, the chum and the pink are the easier ones to raise. Uh, the coho and the chinook, they, you have to rear them for a year before you can release them, you need to grow them bigger. But the, the chum and the pink provide a, a significant revenue source to do other programs. And, and DIPAC not only does um, uh, coho and chinook, but they also have a lot of other community programs, which I'll touch on briefly. And then as far as cost recovery, so 17% of DIPAC's hatchery returns are needed for cost recovery. So that means 83% of the other fish go to mostly to the commercial fisheries and uh, generates about a 15 to $20 million per, per year in excess value for commercial fishermen. Um, but then there's also uh, funding for not just the operations, but other uh, community programs, scholarships, uh, research programs and whatnot. Uh, DIPAC was able to pay off a $42.5 million revolving loan of debt in interest in 2013. So a really interesting funding model that's uh, working well in Alaska, obviously uh, completely different than what we do here, but, but something to, uh, to look at. Uh, they have a visitor center. They see about 70,000 uh, visitors per year. Um, a lot of this is off the cruise ships, people coming in, but you know, a great, you know, there's interpretive exhibits, there's touch tanks, there's, uh, you know, they've got the, the salmon ladders. It's, um, it's, a, it's a really first class, first rate facility. Um, they do, um, they have a Lad Macaulay Memorial Scholarships for, fish, for students interested in fishery and hatchery technology. They, in the off season, they, they uh, have this facility as a community event center. Um, they do educational science tours for local school kids. Um, they contribute funding for statewide fishery research objectives. Uh, they stock local lakes with thousands of rainbows to support youth fishing opportunities. Uh, they have a sport fishing dock next to the hatchery, which is, uh, you know, if, if you want to go somewhere and catch something, it's a good place to go uh, cast your line. And they donate uh, surplus eggs to tribal elders. So a really important part of, uh, of Juneau and the surrounding community. Um, after touring the dye pack facility, we also had the opportunity to tour uh, Taku Fisheries, which is a medium-sized processor. Uh, the the Cost recovery supports two medium-sized processors in Juneau, and uh, you know, obviously, tons of economic benefit. Employs a bunch of people. Um, th our thanks to Hank Baumgard. He's a Bellingham uh, resident that that started going up to Alaska about 30 years ago, and uh, has has developed a really a, a first-class facility up there. Um, but he was. Uh, uh, terrific to take us around and, and show us his operation and tell us how important and critical that uh, their um, the hatchery system was to for him to be able to do business. And then finally, the taste test. I did get a chance to go and uh, catch some of the silvers, and I can report that, yep, they're good and it's fun and tasty. So uh, uh, 
you know, I was at the I was at my kid's soccer game the other day, and someone was like, "Oh man, I got a 30 pound king up on the Skagit," and you know, my blood started racing. And I was like, "Where? Where'd you go?" And you know, and suddenly there was, you know, five other soccer dads and moms crowded around. Just you know, just the energy and buzz that having fish in the rivers creates, and and I mean, it's just it's just incredible. And so um, it's you know, I've I've had the opportunity to work at the port on some you know, really cool projects as far as habitat restoration and removing shoreline armoring and um, eelgrass seeding and, uh, you know, all sorts of things that the experts deem as critical to salmon recovery. But this feels like something that, you know, could have a huge impact and really uh, not to say that everything else isn't important, but uh, um, it's, you know, when you're there and hook into an 18 pound silver and reel one in, you know, the Proof is in the pudding, so it's 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 really cool. So, at any rate, we uh, as I mentioned, Washington's completely different than uh, than Alaska as far as habitat and um, tribal fisheries and permitting and uh, ESA listed species. But next steps on this project are to continue to look at um, throughout the Pacific Northwest at what are best practices related to research, education, community outreach, operation and management of hatcheries. Uh, Fall Creek down in Oregon has a really cool uh, research facility associated with their hatchery. Um, uh, British Columbia has spawning beds, different things, you know, uh, all of which uh, are important to look at and see, you know, what is the latest science saying is, is work. Uh, we need to continue to, to do stakeholder outreach. There's a, um, we all know how big our, our uh, local fisheries uh, community is and, and, you know, everybody from the whale watching and vessels to the commercial fishermen to the processors uh, have a stake in this and, and, and the recreational fishermen guys and on and on and on. And uh, we're anticipating a, a capital budget request in 2019. Again, this is in the big headlines. There's a big push for it. What we'd like to do is is kind of document some of this, this um, best practices as part of that, uh, as part of a feasibility study and then look at the potential on Bellingham's downtown waterfront. We've got uh, two things that you really need for hatcheries. One is land, and the second is uh, clear, clean water, which potentially could be used from the GP pipeline. Um, and so uh, hopefully we can get some money from the state to look at, okay, you know, does this site make sense? You know, we know there's a bunch of issues, but you know, what would it look like if, as far as financing and permitting and, um, meeting some of these statewide objectives, uh, if we could locate a pilot hatchery, which incorporated some of the cost recovery mechanisms they, they use up in Alaska. And obviously there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, as part of that study. But um, again, this is more of a long-term effort. Uh, the, the, as, as we move forward the process, you know, um, DIPAC, the Macaulay hatchery really took about 12 years to start you know, getting the brood stock back and to see significant returns of salmon. So we're under no illusion that this is a, uh, a long-term effort, but um, we need to start. It's, it's too important, so we need to start now. Uh, and just briefly to, to mention the Whatcom Creek hatchery, you know, why couldn't, could we expand that? Could we, could that be used? Um, they're doing a chum hatchery right now. A couple reasons that can't. Um, Number one, their primary objective is a, is a teaching facility. So their, their mission is as a teaching facility. Number two, they have big water quality issues. They get uh, water from Whatcom Creek. They would love to um, you know, be able to access water from the GP pipeline to avoid you know, the, the warmer water temperatures, the sediment loads, um, some of the water quality issues they have that are limiting production. Um, uh, and then three, their footprint's a little bit limited, but they would be a great partner as we've, they've been on our stakeholder group and they've talked about uh, what a great synergy it would be as far as um, collaboration with, with research and teaching and, um, you know, as well as, as maybe getting some of that water too. So um, at any rate, I probably talked for too long. I, I have some hats we brought back for the commissioners that weren't able to attend. And, and uh, if anybody else has anything to add, I was just one set of eyes on the project. Or if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. I'd like to add, add a little bit to your presentation. Um, having fished in southeast Alaska for oh, what, 40 years, um, I was there when 
part of the fishing industry when we started. There's another side to the hatchery that you didn't speak to that I'd like to speak to, and that's the, the part that was uh, put forward by the commercial fishing industry in Southeast Alaska itself. Um, uh, you, you've heard of the, the private hatcheries, but there's also the hatcheries that are funded by the fishing fleet itself. Uh, we have an enhancement tax, and we also do cost recovery, and that's most of the major major fish that uh, the hatcheries produce there come from. We have Majivi, and we have a Hidden Falls hatchery, and we, we've got several. I want to run them all, but um, we borrow money from the state, and uh, it's paid back through our enhancement tax on the gross amount of money that uh, we make as, as fishermen in southeast Alaska. So there's there's more than one mechanism for, for funding these hatcheries. Um, when you try to go to the state or you try to go to the federal people and just get money to build these, it's pretty difficult. But if you can, you can show that you can repay it back uh, through, the, through the fishing fleet itself, it, it has worked very well. Um, release sites, and we're talking, I already speak to 12 years. We just had a return uh, in Sitka, Alaska in, in Crawfish Inlet. Those fish were, were cultivated in the Majibi Hatchery there, and we had a return this is the first year it came back. It's four years is what it takes for a return. Through about, they've, they've caught to date 3.25 million fish. They expected about 800,000 back on the survival. We don't know why the survival rate was so well, but in four years you could, you could have something here if we can put things together. It takes, it takes four years. And, and, and so there's, there's, as you spoke, there's many other ways to do this that, that don't tax the people of the county to have that facility here, and that's some things people don't sometimes realize. Um, the fishermen here in Washington State and Puget Sound, our area here, we tried to put the self-funding program to work in Hood's Canal at their hatchery that's, as you spoke to, is failing. The infrastructure is failing. We were gonna put the money into it and put it together, and we thought we had a deal with the state, and then they turned it down at the last minute. So we've. The fishermen here that, that reside in the state of Washington are willing to put the money forward to make our hatcheries work. We just need help getting there politically. Yeah. So there's there's many things going on. Well, I think that's a terrific point. I had the opportunity when I was in Ketchikan to go meet with some of the um, guys at Sarah that run a couple of the um, hatcheries down in that area. And uh, and you're right. There's there's a lot of different ways that this could be set up, and the the commercial fishermen are a key component of it. And to the extent that there's um, a, a crisis of opportunity, I'd say, you know, with all the eyes on the, you know, declining numbers of Chinook and the orcas, I think there may be the political will to look at a pilot project or look at a different way of doing business or look at something. And, and I think the intriguing thing about this model is it, it you know, rather than being dependent on um, the state and, you know, what's the next crisis and then you lose your funding and, um, you know, it creates a, a possibility for a long-term sustaining uh, funding model to, to either fund it, the hatchery or support its operations. Yeah, I, I don't believe that th these operations can be state-funded. You just spoke to the problem. The money goes in a general fund, and when it disappears, they start cutting, and that's what they've done with our hatcheries. Yeah. You know, the money, the money that uh, is charged to the fishermen through fish tax and all that stuff, it used to go into a separate, years ago it went into a separate account. And then the state decided to put it all in the general fund. Well, it goes all in the general fund, and it just disappears. And that was the first thing, one of the first things they cut. So it, it needs to be industry. I believe, I believe it needs to be industry funded, whether it's, it's uh, Mr. Thomas and, and, the, and the seafood industry on, onshore, as well as the fishermen that are catching the product. It, yeah. And that, that's the only way it can, can be managed and to know that we're going to be safeguarded into the future. Thank you, Mike. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I don't really have any questions, but um, I'll just share that it, it was really an inspiring trip. I, I, I learned a lot, and I think I came in with the conception that this, you know, my, my only exposure to hatcheries was the Washington model. And so going up there, it, they really are operating things differently, and they're having a markedly different level of success. Um, and I kept asking people at the, the processing plants, you know, would, would you guys exist here without the hatchery? Every time, no, definitely not. 
we would we would not exist we would not have the, all the jobs and all the revenue that we create in this community would completely not be here and that goes for a lot of people who work as commercial fishermen as well um, and all the bonus ripple effect just seeing people down there catching fish off the shore uh, the uh, sport fishing industry it has a, a real significant ripple effect and Mike spoke a little bit to that spark of seeing those fish. We could see the, the coho spooling up, getting ready to go up the ladders, and they're just darting around in the water. Fast, you know, healthy, strong fish uh, that are trying to escape from seals that are also chasing them into a whole ecosystem of critters. But it was just inspiring, and I think it would be kind of that electric spark that people would love to see and participate in here. Um, and, and my last comment is, it, it's a great example of good governance. We brought a team of people who were very diverse, who were interested in seeing this occur. Um, people from different political spectrums, people from different points of view, and wanting to seize a moment to do something that is great for the community. And that's also what we've seen in Alaska with the model they have. It's another very diverse stakeholder group that has come together to put something in place. So for me, it's kind of that great goal of what government can do is when we're able to bring together those diverse perspectives and to build on something that we already do well from the great expertise we have at the Bellingham Technical College in their hatchery program. Uh, Brittany, who came with us, is just a wealth of knowledge. She's their hatchery manager. It was fantastic to have her expertise along and with our tribal partners who are also doing hatchery work here in our community. I think we've got all the right ingredients, we've got the right players, and now we just have to seize the moment and do our, do our job to make this happen. Mr. Hogan, thank you. Um, first and foremost, is there any chance, because I've got such a big head that I don't get to hat, but can I take that fish from you? That, did, that, <laughs> did that make it home? Uh, Commissioner Shepard, did he say 18 pounds? It's up to 18 pounds? I, I, it, keeps, <laughs> it keeps growing. <laughs> Yeah. I think I said 20. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to speak just for myself. Uh, first of all, uh, as soon as uh, Mr. Fix brought this to my attention as a possibility for um, the port to do, I have not been able to get it out of my mind. I cannot think of anything more important to bring to this community than something like this. Um, and I, I think if I could leave my term knowing that we put this in place. Um, I think that's a great legacy to have. And I, um, I don't even want to start with a pilot project. I see absolutely no reason to toy around with a pilot project when we know that this is the kind of thing that we can get started. Um, I love the idea of the self-funded. When, when I think about the complexities of having a state-run operation, um, I don't have any desire. I think an RFP or some kind of a public private or even a um, nonprofit like they do up there since it's so successful if you've got 25 out of 29 self-funded facilities I think that's a huge thing but I can't think of any better legacy for this commission to leave behind than to say that we put this in motion um, no, I want to you said term it was terms not term terms <laughs> that's, that's plural not singular, okay? You did get that, right? I did. So there's nothing I can think of better than to leave with my terms <laughs> than this legacy. Um, seriously, this this excites me more than anything that um, I can possibly imagine, and um, I think you're going to find a green light from most of us up here. But thank you for taking the time. Thank you for not sharing your salmon with me. I'm sure. If I could add one, one more thing to my comments, and this, and this is a, a personal thought of mine, and I've thought about it long and hard, and I've come to believe it. We have a lot of natural disasters that occur, and, and a lot of them occur on our streams, and, and you can wipe out fish runs. Um, a lot of people believe that hatchery fish are genetically altered, and that's incorrect. They're wild fish in, enhanced through the hatchery, so we have a higher survival rate um, for one reason or another. But let's imagine for a minute that we have an earthquake uh, on the Nooksack River, that, that, that watershed. We have an earthquake up there and it, and it totally destroys all your salmon spawning beds, which can be rebuilt. 
so you wipe out the entire fish run in the, in the Nooksack River for that for that particular year. If you have a hatchery system on on site or somewhere in the area that's using uh, native fish for broodstock for your eggs to start that hatchery, it's like having having fish in a vault, a safety vault. You can take those fish from that hatchery, those eggs. You can take them and you can you can put that stream back to life after that natural disaster. And that's someone no one no one thinks about very often. Is it's 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 really at this time when our environment's changing as rapidly as it is and we're warming, uh, uh, we could actually if we have hatcheries, we we can we can save the fish. I, I really believe hatcheries are gonna be the savior of our fish at some point in time. Um, when we do do more more damage upstream to the uh, to the river systems as we grow, so it's it's something I that I truly believe that the hatcheries are a good thing. They're a safety valve for when something bad happens. We can put things back together. Thanks, and, Mike. And it's a it's an important comment because there there is criticism for hatcheries, and and I think it's part of the the reason it's not just funding, but the state has also responded to criticism about. Um, the negative externalities of, of a hatchery program. And I think the message that came through loud and clear from the Alaska uh, folks and what I think we, we'll all continue to support is habitat restoration continues without abatement. And I think what you're going to see in the governor's proposal is more money for habitat restoration. We're going to keep doing that because everybody wants, whether it's the Alaska model or here, we want wild fish and wild rivers. That's that's a the the goal for that I think everyone shares. But if you're not doing this hatchery program um, at the same time, there are just not enough fish to go around. And we've seen the detrimental impacts of reducing these hatchery programs. And it is not a one choice or the other. We do both, and we do both of them well. And um, this is the. I truly do believe they are wild fish, um, and we're giving them that head start, just like we, we do with our kids, putting them in school and preschool. And we're giving, giving them that head start to get out, out the door and, and come back successful. Um, and it's, it's not a choice between uh, doing restoration work and hatcheries. It, it's really a doing both. Commissioner Shipper, I like that analogy. <laughs> My mind is reeling with what I can make with that analogy. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Great comments. Well done. We'll, we'll, um, we're going to circulate a, a trip report to you guys next week, which includes pictures, the presentations we had, key lessons learned, um, describes you know the Alaska and the, the Washington system, and, and we'll uh, we'll continue to keep this as a priority moving forward. So, did you guys make it to the Red Dog Saloon to play in the sawdust on the floor, or what? Uh, no comment. <laughs> yeah, we, we did make it to the Red Dog, and yeah, uh, Juno. Juno's a great town, so we, it is. we did enjoy ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. And um, and Brady, I saw bear while hiking. Brady, I'm going to apologize, but I think it's time for a five minute break, and then we'll come back, uh, reconvene, and uh, go to. Good call.
Okay, now we'll begin our session, Brady. Two dry runs. <laughs> we'll start this session with a uh, public comment period. Uh, this is our final co public comment period of the night. We'll allow two minutes. Any, nobody signed up? Uh, we don't have anyone signed up. Anybody wishing to say anything about anything to anyone? Wow. That's good. I like that. That being said, we're going to make this one stick, Brady. And here's Brady. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Um, Brady Scott, real estate representative with the Port of Bellingham. Uh, th this presentation is on the Blaine Marine industrial area. Uh, the purpose is to follow up on our um, presentation that we gave you last April and update you on activity since that time. It also sets the stage for the first action item tonight regarding entering memorandum of understanding with tenants who wish to expand their leaseholds in the Blaine Marine Industrial Area. Uh, first, uh, the Blaine Marine Inc. cleanup site. Uh, in, in July, we began uh, work on the cleanup project, which is uh, currently ongoing and scheduled to be completed in October. Uh, the red area there shows uh, roughly the area IMCO is occupying currently to do the work. Activity so far has included utility work, abatement, and building demolition. Uh, this picture here shows uh, a beforehand picture of the uh, former Blaine Marina Inc. building, and then uh, now after demolition, which was last week. Um, IMCO is currently um, excavating uh, the contaminated soils and then um, will backfill that area and install bio bioremediation systems and then grade and partially pave the site. Uh, the project is currently ahead of schedule and if all goes well with the excavation this week um, and next, the majority of the work could be done by the end of September. Uh, with the work complete, uh, the area opened up will um, look like that. Um, as a part of this project, uh, the north portion of that area will be paved and the south portion left unpaved pending future access improvement uh, project uh, where stormwater systems can be designed and factored in. Uh, we're also um, working at the Walsh Marine lease site. Uh, we're actually working on uh, removing a tent structure and the construction of a new building. The Walsh Marine tent, uh, which looks like that and is located there, was significantly damaged in a storm and is uh, no longer functional. So demolition has been bid and awarded to WRS and the uh, pre-construction meeting is this Thursday and we'll meet with the uh, contractor and Norm Walsh on site to coordinate and schedule the work on uh, demolition to follow shortly thereafter. And that'll remove that. Uh, second is the construction of the Walsh Marine Building, which is uh, gonna be located uh, just south of the current tent location. <clears throat> um, the front of the building will look something like that. Uh, in July, you will recall uh, that we modified the lease with Walsh Marine and updated the budget to um, move forward with that project. Um, we are currently in design and permitting phase um, with assistance by RMC. And uh, a PSA agreement amendment was just approved in earlier uh, today's consent agenda. And we expect the shoreline development permit application to be submitted by the end of this month. So we're moving forward. Also today, we just submitted an economic development investment program application today for uh, requesting $250,000, one third in the form of a grant and two thirds in the form of a loan. Uh, the bid for the work is expected uh, later this fall and ex construction expected this uh, winter. We're also working on uh, relocation of the web house uh, as you're aware, the new Web House 1 is currently being constructed on the other side of the marina at Mill Holland Drive near the boat launch. And that work is scheduled for completion in, in uh, late winter of 2019. 
The existing web house at the Blaine Marina industrial area shown there will be demolished following um, a period of time for the occupants to relocate to the new web house and Walsh Marine to locate um, out of the web house and into his new building. The current idea is to um, demo the building and temporarily leave the, the slab in place pending future access and stormwater improvement design in that area. Turning to bulkhead repair and replacement work, um, we're currently in the design phase for that. Uh, the scope of the work will involve uh, repairs in the vicinity of the Boundary Fish and Walsh Marine sites on the southern area. Uh, we're also looking at replacement of bulkheads at the Sawtooth Dock and the former TNM Protein Lot. Um, we're currently working from a, a budget of uh, $660,000 for the design work and requesting additional funding in the 2019 um, capital budget for construction. Uh, the work will likely begin at the onset of the in-water work window in uh, August of 2019, and then follow, uh, that would be following the demolition of the web house. And we are working on um, whether this will be completed all at once or possibly phased into two construction periods. In addition to uh, those bulkhead projects, uh, we're requesting funding in the 2019 capital budget to determine a scope of work and cost estimate to repair the underbuilding bulkheads in the starfish lease and boundary fish sites, and those are located in those two areas. Um, Construction of those bulkheads would be forecast for 2020 um, pending negotiations with tenants on cost share agreement and future commission approvals. Uh, given the work to date and to uh, pave the way for future tenant expansions and to modernize the Blaine Marine Industrial Area, we are requesting funding in the 2019 budget to also design access utility and stormwater improvements in this area. Uh, the central corridor extending between the North Pier and the Sawtooth Dock and extending down from Marine Drive. Construction of the access utility and stormwater um, is forecast for 2020 following the bulkhead repair work and um, pending um, design and future budget processes. As uh, previously mentioned, we've uh, multiple tenants, uh, parties interested in expanding their leaseholds in the Blaine Marine Industrial Area, including Boundary Fish, who wishes to um, construct a building to increase capacity for value-added products, uh, Walsh Marine, uh, to expand um, their shipyard and increase capacity and efficiency of the yard. Uh, Dakota Creek Shellfish uh, is interested in building a shellfish hatchery uh, in that area. And um, Drayton Harbor Fishery currently operates a fish buying facility under a month-to-month -month agreement and is interested in a long-term lease in that area. Please note that uh, these areas are all um, yet to be defined and determined. Port staff uh, generally support these projects, but given the redevelopment work outlined uh, above, um, the property to expand into is currently not available to lease. In order to make this land available, the port uh, needs to complete its current projects and get further along in the design of the access, utility, stormwater improvements, and the bulkheads. Uh, as we determine what property is needed for those improvements, uh, we'll be able to develop a binding site plan uh, or a land survey to delineate the specific parcels available to lease. Uh, in addition, the port need to, may need to revise the scheme of harbor improvements to uh, facilitate the development and expansion of the site. One particular reason for this is the current scheme of harbor improvements proposes a loop trail through the Blaine Marine Industrial Area. Timing-wise, we, um, we believe that we'll need a good portion of 2019 to develop the plans and designs and determine what land is available to lease. 
Uh, we also need to understand further uh, what development the tenants are proposing in order to best design the Blaine Marine Industrial Area to accommodate. Uh, given these uh, needs, port staff will be recommending on the first action item today authorization to enter into memorandum of understanding with the, these tenants. And that concludes the update. We're happy to move into the memorandum of understanding first action item, if you, if you like. If it pleases the commission, let's move directly into the MOU discussion. Okay, a motion please. to authorize the executive director to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the Port of Bellingham and Dakota Creek Shellfish regarding property at the Blaine Marine Industrial Area. And a motion to authorize the executive director to negotiate and enter into a mem memorandum of understanding between the Port of Bellingham and the following tenants, Boundary Fish Company, Drayton Harbor Fishery, and Walsh Marine, regarding property at the Blaine Marine Industrial Area. Gentlemen, any discussion? Commissioner Briscoe. These, uh, these pieces of property are yet to be determined, so these memorandum of understandings are just, uh, do we have guidelines on the property, or how are we doing that? So the, the intent of the memorandum of understanding is to uh, work cooperatively with these um, uh, parties uh, and to work towards identifying the um, parcels uh, proposed for their project um, and particularly uh, uh, determining specific lease size, locations, and infrastructure needs and to determine whether the property is available to lease. Um, if we find then that um, we can move forward, uh, we would um, work with the parties to negotiate a lease and subject to commission approval. So basically these are just placeholders for property as it becomes available so that uh, our tenants that are there now have uh, basically first right to, to expand their businesses, correct? Uh, it, it allows us to cooperatively work with these uh, tenants to um, understand their direct needs uh, and uh, while we're also um, working to design our um, infrastructure improvements in there so we can balance those act, it doesn't create any formal um, commitment um, to entering into a lease that would be subject to a, a further um, commission approval. But, but it does allow the tenants some uh, uh, reasonable comfort that they can start their planning process, maybe spending some money on the planning process without knowing it's just going to go down the drain. Uh, Mr. Burrell is in the audience and he will be affected by this and I'd like to, does this, this MOU, does it uh, satisfy what you need to move forward? Or quit, uh, are you comfortable with this? Can, can we give him a microphone? Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Well, we are private industry and we'd like to jump quickly like normal. We understand the public process. So in that understanding, the staff has been very a great open-minded communication with everybody and commissioners. I want to thank you very much for that. So yes, we are comfortable with it. We have, uh, we'll be starting our permitting process, assuming that this is okay today. And I think it's about as good as we can get at this point. So, so this satisfies the needs for you to start that process. Yes, it enables should be. you to do that. We'll get the permitting process going. Okay, very good. That, that's all the questions I have, Brady. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think our intent was to make a fair and equal process here and give some stability to our existing tenants who I, I think we're all just thrilled to see how excited everyone is and has the capacity to expand and provide more job opportunities in this area. It speaks to the importance of the environmental cleanup and getting that done, getting it done in a timely fashion, doing it right. So we've got ability uh, to move on. And it's just ongoing evidence of our investment in, in Blaine to really build this out and bring it back to the capacity it's been. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Drop the mic. Boom. That was good. I have nothing to add. No, good. Shall we move? Regarding the property at the Blaine Marine Industrial Area, a motion to authorize the executive director to enter into a memorandum of understanding between the Port 
of Bellingham and Dakota Creek Shellfish and a motion to authorize the executive director to negotiate and enter into Miranda, memorandum of understanding between the Port of Bellingham and the following Boundary Bay Fish Company, Boundary Fish Company, Drayton Harbor Fishery, and Walsh Marine. I'm glad you said that, not me. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Briscoe. Aye, aye. Commissioner Shepherd. Aye. Commissioner Bell is an aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Brady, before you leave, I just want you to know the people before you gave gifts. <laughs> what, what, you didn't not, come bearing not, gifts? Not, but not, not there's any expectation, just... How many lashes is that? Making a note. <laughs> Action item number two. A motion to approve the termination of lease and settlement agreement between the Port of Bellingham and First American Title Insurance Company, and a motion by... The, a motion to approve the new commercial lease between the Port of Bellingham and the non-GMO project for Suite 301 Bellwether Building. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Judy Harvey, Senior Real Estate Representative. The transaction before you today is with regard to the termination of lease with First American Title and a new commercial lease with the non-GMO project. We have with us today from the non-GMO project their Executive Director, Megan West, their Chief Operating Officer and CFO, Jeff Bowes, and Nikki Olison, Director of Operations. First American had a contractual right to go dark, and they did so in April 2017, and they continued to have a contractual right to terminate the lease February 2019. In exchange for the termination of lease, we're looking at entering into a five-year lease with the non-GMO project and two five-year renewal options with First American paying the first two months of base rent for the non-GMO project, about $23,000. The leasehold premises are nearly 8,000 square feet, and we feel very fortunate to have a new tenant, uh, hopefully with your approval, uh, the non-GMO project prior to First American title terminating its lease in 2019. Would like to also add that with this new lease, we have um, nearly 100% occupancy in Bellwether Building with only a small suite remaining available for lease. We are very excited about this opportunity to have the non-GMO project at Bellwether. And initially, they anticipate 35 employees with the potential of um, hopefully growing into 50 employees. Uh, real estate staff does recommend approval of this transaction, and if the commission has any questions, we would like to answer those. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to give a little background. I, I was ignorant, as I think many people are, about uh, the organization here. Um, it, it's one of those organizations you might see their, their logo on products. Um, and I've seen their logos on products for years, but I had never connected that they've been in Bellingham all this time. Um, but they've been around for almost, for 11 years now. And uh, they're, I, I had the opportunity when I finally connected the dots, I had someone from your organization be a guest speaker in one of my graduate courses on uh, governance. And you guys did a great job and uh, they are an interesting uh, organization. It would be a new, um, a new type of tenant here at the port, but they have labels on what I looked up was 43,000 different products covering around 3,000 brands and something of almost $20 billion in sales, not, for, not the non-GMO project ex necessarily, but those products that they label um, are involved in $20 billion of sales uh, internationally. So they're a, a, a homegrown project that has, uh, you know, a wide scope and impact. So uh, with, with our approval, we'll welcome you. I have no comments. Welcome. I'm also a neighbor. I'm over across the street in 12. So just be aware be a that... A closer neighbor. It sounds like there's Soon to be taking that extra space over yeah, there. Yeah, there's one more left. What's up? Just if be aware that when Western's using the conference room, you need to get there at 7 a.m. to get a parking place. See, we're pitching for you, Shirley. We're trying. Just a heads up. <laughs> tea. Yeah, great tea in my office. Come on over. 
He's quiet and well behaved, so we've heard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that being said, welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, any other comments? I have none. A motion to approve the termination of lease and settlement agreement between the Port of Bellingham and First American Title Insurance Company, and a motion to approve the new commercial lease between the Port of Bellingham and the non-GMO project for Suite 301 Bellwether Building. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome Thank you, board. Welcome. The final part of our agenda, which is other business. Judy, did you also take note that What's, she's not bringing the joke. You're not bringing any goodies. What are we doing up here? <laughs> We're not allowed to take them. Yeah. All right. With that, other business? Alan, thank you. I don't have any. <laughs> what a night. Mm -hmm. Mr. Briscoe, any other business? Oh, I guess one thing. Um, when we put the fireboat house in for the city of Bellingham, we, we took a dock out. And uh, Rob, Director Fix, and I had spoken about this. And I'd like to get it back up in, in the forefront here and we get it back going that we replace that dock somehow. And the reason we need to replace it is the the dock that was taken out had a ramp down to it with a float. So uh, um, be it non-commercial vessels or commercial vessels could get up to that ramp and do some repair work and stuff and people could go up and down a ramp instead of climbing up and down a ladder as the tide goes in and out. Um, we gave up the, it had the, uh, exi it had the old fireboat house was there on one side that was taken out and we built a new fireboat house over uh, to the east of that now, where the old grid used to be, and then the other side of the dock is used by the port for its boats. So we don't have a float, or the fleet doesn't have a float, be it commercial or yacht. They don't have a float anymore that you can walk down a ramp, and uh, our, our companies, our engine companies, or whoever it is, we're doing the work, can get right to the vessels easily. Um, when it was taken out, it was kind of agreed mutually that we'd try and put it back in. We have to come up with some wa over water coverage, if I'm not incorrect. And uh, I'd like to, to see us get started on that project. I'd like to get staff directed and trying to figure out where we're going to come up with the overwater coverage. We need to replace that float uh, and put the ramp and the float back in. The existing little pier is still there. I'm assuming we still have the ramp somewhere hidden. Um, no, we got rid of the ramp. Yeah. I caught you off guard, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> Alan Birdsall, manager of marinas. Yeah, that ramp was an old ramp uh, that was well out of date and no longer serviceable. So it's going to require a new ramp, and uh, do we have a float, or do we have to build a new float? Uh, we'd probably have to get a new float or repurpose um, one if we rebuild a float someplace else, but we'd need a ramp, and uh, most likely it would have to be an ADA ramp, which would be about 80 feet long and stick the thing pretty far out there. It might restrict access to the first couple of spots there on the sawtooth. Well, if we didn't have an existing ADA ramp there, why would we have to put one in? Oh, well, when you do improvements, you got to all of a sudden become ADA compliant. Placement, not improvement. Well, that's an improvement, unfortunately. <laughs> um, uh, in, at any rate, 80 feet seems like a long ways to go. But I'd, I'd like to see us get get some direction to put back in what we took away. So we're going to, there's some, Commissioner Briscoe, now that you're back, we need to spend some time talking about this because there are some folks that don't want that float back in there because they like the better access. But what we'll do is, let's do this in the budget process because we have to get the money in the budget for something anyway. So we'll make sure we have money in the budget as a placeholder for this project. We'll start going down the road of doing the permitting. But in the meantime, you and I have to have some conversations with some stakeholders that aren't happy about it coming back. I'm a stakeholder. I'm happy about it. I, I, I recognize you're a, a large stakeholder. <laughs> okay. And I have no opinion on it because it's the first time I've heard of it. So yeah, I think, I think we to took it out in. before you came into office, both of you. Yeah, it, was, it had to be taken out for the new boathouse to be permitted. That was one of the requirements of the new boathouse. Yeah. Slide it over. So I'm, I'm not saying it shouldn't go back. I'm just saying we need to have some conversations to make sure that we're Good. doing it. But we will put some money in the budget for it, and we will get the permitting started. Just knowing that it's 
makes me want to think about the sequencing of when we address it. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to have a little more conversation on it. We are trying to put together a budget meeting for October uh, for capital only because I think the operating is pretty dialed in. So I'm not sure if we have a date yet for that, but uh, that'd be a good time to have that discussion too. Give us some time to prepare for it. Any other business? Okay, so my only last bit of business is just to announce some things that are coming up. Uh, first, we've got the Marine Advisory Committee coming up October 9th at 6 p.m. in the Harbor Center building. Uh, the Technical Airport Advisory Committee coming up November 8th at 9.30 p.m. in the ARF Conference Room. And then the Bellingham International Airport Advisory Committee, the BIAC, is coming up Thursday, November 8th at 5 p.m. in the ARF Conference Room. And then I also want to remind everybody that this is the weekend for this. <laughs> this is the most exciting event, in my mind, um, in this county. And uh, it could have been in that book. It could have been a slurper, you know. It, sur it surpasses the <laughs> fair by a long shot. Um, so I'm excited to see what uh, what's going to happen this weekend, and I can't wait to, to get down there. So with that, I have nothing more. And... Add at 2 o'clock, I'm scheduled to possibly get sick eating oysters. <laughs> no, it's not possible. It is going to happen. <laughs> I, I had Jim told me I didn't have to shuck them, but he did tell me I had to eat them with my hands behind my back. And no chewing. Yeah. Well, if you chew, it takes too long. Yeah. He's got to swallow. Yeah. And I do wish you well with that. <laughs> <laughs> with that, meeting adjourned. <laughs>